welcome to uh, this virtual session of a new development agenda. How do we leapfrog out of the pandemic economy, create a better world in which people are able to prosper, uh, a more inclusive world and a sustainable world? That's the bold ambition of this session. Uh, and I'm delighted to have uh, four highly qualified uh, panelists to help us think about these issues. I'm Ian Golden. I'm the Professor of Globalization and Development at the University of Oxford. And uh, I've been involved with the World Economic Forum uh, since I was made a global leader of tomorrow um, in the 1990s when I was working as advisor to President Mandela and running the State Bank in South Africa. Uh, subsequently, I was vice president and had a policy at the World Bank and left in 2006 to come to Oxford, where I'm now based. I'm joined uh, by Fatoumata Ba, the founder and executive chair of Django, which is in France, and she's a global leader of tomorrow as well, a younger version of the cohort that I was of so many years ago. Alfred Hanning, who's the executive director of the Alliance for Financial Inclusion in Malaysia. Actually, today he's in uh, Germany. Uh, Dej Udom Napodol, the chief sustainability officer of the CP Group based in Thailand. He's in Bangkok. Um, Deborah Revalotella, who's the chief economist of the European Investment Bank in Luxembourg, and she indeed is in Luxembourg. The question we want to address today is how do we find new approaches? What is the practical pathway uh, from the disruption we're experiencing today towards a more inclusive uh, development around the world? It's a bold agenda. It requires multiple dimensions. And the different panelists today offer different perspectives on this. Clearly, technology, finance, and all sorts of policy changes are going to be needed, and all of this in the context of getting uh, to zero carbon emissions. Let's begin uh, with Devra Revolotella uh, from the uh, EIB. And the question for Devra is what new approaches to development policies have been taken by the development finance institutions uh, to steer economies towards the sustainable growth trajectories and has there been a change in policy as a result of the pandemic? Thank you very much. And uh, I'm uh, really happy to have uh, the honor to kick start uh, this debate. And uh, I think uh, the, the answer um, to your question really comes, uh, the second part is really important. So are uh, development policies changing because of the pandemic? And the answer is yes. I think what we are seeing is that the crisis is having a massive impact and really requires NDB and DFIs to uh, adapt their approach and to deal with two angles, the one of the short term uh, immediate response and the angle of uh, having a look at the long term challenge and using uh, the, the, the switch from the short term to the long term somehow to leapfrog, as you are mentioning, and trying to look at the potential that are related to, I would focus on three elements. On the one side, impact investment, then sustainable investment, and then the opportunity of moving for, um, for, uh, um, for creating uh, jobs, uh, trying uh, to, um, to uh, push for the, um, uh, the demographic dividends that uh, some of the countries in the region are. Uh, this is the key message that I would like to pass, but uh, uh, I would like to qualify a couple of the elements that I was mentioning. The crisis is having a massive impact. And uh, we have been working on uh, uh, defining uh, something that is uh, the economic vulnerability indicator uh, for, uh, for emerging markets and developing economies. So what we have been looking at uh, is uh, the economic vulnerability to a crisis like the one generated by this specific pandemic. 
So we look at the three elements, uh, the health of the health sector and then exposure of the population in terms of age exposure, um, age composition of the population. Then the economic structure of the countries, the dependency on commodity, global value chain, tourism, and also the dependency on remittances. And then uh, the capacity to withstand the shocks, uh, looking at FDIs, but also at uh, the sovereign and financial sector strengths. And what we see is a number of uh, areas of immediate vulnerability of the economy that actually are uh, the vulnerability to the economy that we were detecting already starting from February, March, from March, are now materializing as uh, actual uh, issues uh, and the uh, immediate threat uh, for some of the economies. So we start uh, seeing uh, the financial situation and the capacity of the countries uh, to respond uh, in the short term uh, to the shock uh, at risk. And that's a uh, compromise uh, the bull uh, story of uh, the support we can provide. So what we have been doing uh, as the EIB, we, um, people may not know, the European Investment Bank is very well known for the activities in Euro, but uh, on an annual basis, we lend some 7.8 billion out of the European Union. When the crisis came, what we did was to try to front load as much as money on the ground as we could, 5.2 billion, a part of the Team Europe, effort has been directed and trying to uh, try to move uh, very fast uh, supporting the health sector, uh, mostly the, the public sector, health sector, and then supporting the private sector, uh, looking at uh, the opportunities uh, that uh, can, can, uh, can be um, uh, used uh, for, uh, for the future. And in looking at the private, both the public and the private sector intervention, we try to focus on three concepts. On the one side, impact investment. We very strongly embrace the idea of, um, as a multinational development bank, but also DFI, the impact investment, where we try to maximize the social and the economic externalities, so not only looking at the short-term financials. This is particularly important in a moment like the one that we are living now. And what we do is that we commit to measure a report on the output outcome of what we do exactly to maximize this impact. This is one way in which we are moving more. But that's obviously in the short term, you have to be fast. In the medium to long term, you have to maximize the impact. So the moving fast on the one side is also to be accompanied by a better way for uh, internalizing uh, what are uh, the, um, the externalities of the project. The second point where we are moving is what I was uh, mentioning before, uh, so focus on sustainability and uh, the, the um, demographic dividend out of, uh, um, of uh, the countries. On the one side, uh, we think that uh, the effort, both in terms of sustainability, most in terms of sustainability, but also in terms of uh, um, secular transformation on the job market, they are uh, quite important on the one side. Uh, they, uh, generate Deborah, Deborah, sorry, can yeah. I ask you to, um, to begin to wrap up? You've already taken five yeah. minutes. Thank yeah, you. yeah, I'm sorry. No, uh, the, what I'm saying is uh, that uh, both the sustainability and uh, uh, and uh, the secular transformation in the job market, uh, they have an uh, effect uh, that uh, may be uh, challenging in the long term, uh, but they also associate a lot of uh, job opportunities in the transformation. So what we are trying to do is uh, to uh, try to look at the job opportunities that this generate and trying to focus on projects where the job creation, in particular decent job creation, is, uh, is important. So just wrapping up completely, I think uh, um, MDV and DFI have a clearly in mind that there is a short-term shock and that's require immediate action. On the other side, that there is a medium to long term transformation that needs to be, um, to be uh, accompanied and supported. And that's where impact investment, sustainability investment, and the focus on a decent job has to come in. Thank you. Thanks very much. And um, that is uh, very clear, short-term shock, how to deal with it, and long run, uh, transformation 
uh, needs. We'll now turn to uh, Fatima Seba. Uh, Fatima, what are the key barriers that prevent leapfrogging, uh, particularly in developing countries? And what do you think could be some of the ideas to overcome those barriers? Thank you very much, Haim. Um, this conversation is extremely important, especially um, when we think that currently in Africa we are losing, um, I think, every month $60 billion GDP, and um, we already lost $3 million, um, 3 million net jobs, uh, which is quite critical because um, we've actually created today 3 million net jobs, and we need to create 20 million of them um, to, to cope with the demographic increase. And to me, there are three huge challenges um, that help that are preventing today's uh, leapfrog of our economies. The first one is really when it comes to investment, especially investment available to uh, technology companies in the venture capital um, space. Um, as you know, um, many of these um, startups today are helping to accelerate and massify access to financial services, access to energy, access to healthcare and access to education. However, they raised only uh, $2 billion last year. And if you compare that amount to, for instance, India, it's 17 times less when you have the same demography in Africa than in India, when you have the same GDP, roughly $3,000 billion GDP, and we actually have more internet users in Africa than in India. So that's one huge challenge. Um, and even looking at how the investment that is already available is split is very inequitable as well. Um, geographically first, because you have on four countries concentrating 90% of the investment, um, Nigeria, Egypt, Kenya, and South Africa, when you have so many fragile states, especially in West African Francophone countries. Um, you have issues also around, uh, you know, looking at the gender uh, question. Um, I think women in Africa are the most entrepreneurial in the world with a total entrepreneurial activity rate of 26%, and yet you have 42 billion a cap uh, and it's actually uh, preventing us from achieving an extra $150 billion of GDP. And that is uh, extremely important to invest in more financial intermediaries that are helping to increase the amount of investment available, but also channel it the right way. So second aspect is really scalability. Uh, when you look at uh, intervention that are important to be able to leapfrog uh, development, they have to be able to actually touch the masses to be effective. Um, and it's so important in the context of Africa where you have actually 54 countries is, uh, actually 55 African Union member states. Um, and here I see uh, it's a huge challenge, but it, it, there are some maybe good news in terms of opportunities because there have been a ratification of uh, a continental free trade area uh, that should um, help more uh, startups, but also uh, SMEs and other uh, companies uh, really tap into a broader market. It will be actually the largest single market since the creation of WTO when it's really uh, fully effective. And the the third dimension is really uh, regula regulatory challenges. Um, if you look, for instance, at a study uh, done by BCG, um, they estimate that e-commerce only could create uh, more than 3 million net jobs by 2025 in Africa. Yet, when you look at the United Nations um, uh, Commission for Trade-Related Development Index on e-commerce preparedness, out of the 10 least prepared countries worldwide, nine are in Africa. So it speaks very highly of how we are not geared to be able to tap effectively into these opportunities that are not only yielding good financial results, but also helping drive social impact. And I think these three challenges are exactly what um, someone like me, a former entrepreneur and now a uh, uh, impact investor are really uh, passionate about. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much, um, Fatimata, and those very clear messages regarding investment scalability and regulatory harmonization and their potential impact. We'll come back to, I hope, some of those um, if we have time. Uh, Alfred Hanning, what role can financial inclusion policies play in supporting uh, this technological leapfrogging? And as a head of an organization devoted to that, we look forward to your comments. Well, thanks for uh, for bringing us to this forum. Um, the question is uh, is very timely, and um, uh, I wanted to share a couple of points with you. And they're actually quite related to what uh, Fatumata shared with us on the opportunities. First of all, financial inclusion, which we understand as the affordable and appropriate um, and high quality provision of financial services to wider segments of the population. That has come into everyone's interest, I, th I think, since the financial crisis. 
Um, and um, I think today what we have seen is a broadening of the mandate of the financial regulators, particularly in emerging and developing economies um, that actually have understood that uh, financial inclusion goes hand in hand in a complementary way with their traditional mandate on monetary and financial stability. So that is a very important point to make. And we have seen it in the last past uh, 12 years, I should say. And in the network, which is a network of 90 countries, financial regulators from 90 countries, we have actually seen 680 policy um, implementations that have taken place and that has led to around 650 million that have been included in addition. And of course, you can be sure that um, a lot of this has happened because of the technological advances, advances that we have seen. But I also would like for a minute to take the micro perspective here. And that is, we just need to understand that even access to the smallest financial service for a poor woman can make a huge difference uh, in that life. And I think that is why we are doing it. Now, how does leapfrogging work? And this is an important point. I mean, many of us look at East Africa when we discuss uh, these success stories like Kenya, Tanzania, but there are many other countries who are following suit. And I would just, for example, now take the, the, the Ghana example. The Bank of Ghana, in fact, show, uh, showcased the role of mobile money innovations in advancing financial inclusion very impressively. Just to give you this number, as of 2018, Ghana had only 15 million bank accounts, but 32.5 million mobile money accounts. And the mobile money accounts increased in only three years from 2014 to 2017 from 13% to 40%, which is actually um, the number of adults above 15 years. And even when you look at the gender aspect, very interesting, we, we also saw a tripling of access in mobile money accounts for female customers from 12 to 34%. We have many other countries who have, um, um, who have noted uh, you've got, uh, very similar developments. And I think the question is now really, what is the potential that we can use, especially, and I think uh, the first speaker made this um, distinction between short-term and medium-term, we call it immediate mitigation and recovery phase after the pandemic. <clears throat> um, and I think many countries have started, we have seen in our network that regulators have reacted um, very, very effectively already. And this is basically around regulations um, uh, uh, to reduce the reliance on cash-based transactions. But how can we leverage this now? And I think technology is certainly uh, the first point uh, that we would make. And we have seen these examples that I mentioned, but there are also other dimensions. And these are mostly related to broader objectives like sustainable development goals. Let's look at gender. Um, women's um, financial inclusion is extremely important and we have seen a huge gender gap. Closing this gender gap can have a dramatic impact. Same with forcibly displaced persons. Uh, serving this clientele better um, can have dramatic impact on economic growth and development. Then of course, the youth. And this is a point I just wanted to make. Um, you know, when I talked to my neighbor, someday he said to me, look, my son has never seen a record and we all have seen a record, but some people have never seen a record in their life. They don't even know what it is. And I can be very sure that in 10 years down the road, we will have young people who have never seen a financial a banknote or a coin in their hand, but they are using financial services, digital financial services. This is dramatic. And I think that's a huge potential for us, but we also have to protect these people because there are of course many, many issues such as privacy and other consumer protection issues. Now, the other element I want to mention is inclusive green finance. We can also now make sure that we actually address issues at the lower end of the market when it comes to providing sustainable financial services, even through financial inclusion. So this is very important. And many people talk about resetting the button. Yeah, but what does it mean resetting the button? For us, it means including these reform elements, broadening the lens, bringing in the SDG relevance into the work of the financial regulators in a complementary way to their traditional mandates on monetary and financial stability. So this is basically the first message I wanted to make. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, very comprehensive, uh, an extraordinary re reach that you have through your 90 countries. So uh, tremendously effective. So thank you uh, very much for that. Mr. Napodol, um, what is the role of local and global firms operating in developing countries to achieve this? And what should be done to support private sector development sustainably? Thank you, Professor Godin. Uh, let me introduce my company. Uh, CP Group is a Thai conglomerate with three 
core businesses, agro-industry and food, retail and distribution, media and telecommunication. We operate in 21 countries and our products and services are available in 85 countries. This year, we are 99 years of age. The company is fortunate to pursue its long-term quest of value creation based on three benefit principles. First, benefits to the countries where we operate. <laughs> Second, to the communities we engage with. And finally, to our company and employees. We believe that uh, e economic growth can only be sustainable with a solid foundation of strong society with healthy people and healthy environment. As an employer, we need to ensure all our colleagues are well protected during this health and economic crisis. They can continue to have good job with adequate income to help drive the local economy along. So we put uh, in place strong hygiene measures, announced a no layoff policy and provided food and other assistance to our workers as well as healthcare workers and people under quarantine. And beyond the community, up to the national and international level, we partner with the government and healthcare sector to identify the urgent needs for surgical masks, which had been in short supply. Within five weeks, we built a world-class factory to supply masks to healthcare workers in Thailand, and over 9 million masks have been distributed so far. Recognizing that the economy downturn during this pandemic would lead to massive job losses and lack of opportunities for new graduates entering the labor market. Our retail affiliate CPO hired an additional 20,000 people to help support the e-commerce and delivery businesses right at the beginning of the pandemic. As the pandemic is still an ongoing concern, we are currently hiring additional 28,000 positions in multiple business units. Apart from responding to the pandemic and related impacts, uh, the business sector is a vital development partner in achieving the SDGs within the remaining 10 years, decade of action. This movement will require massive investment in multiple areas to help us get closer to the goals many advancements we have made in the past five years have seen set back during the pandemic to address the various Global development challenges, we need massive investment. The United Nations estimated that we need to invest about 3.3 to 4.5 trillion US dollars per year to achieve the SDG by 2030. This kind of investment can only be possible if all sectors come together to share resources as well as to share risk. The business sector with its management experience, human and financial capital, as well as understanding of the market can help public sector entities leverage their resource on development projects, initiatives led by business, such as R&D partnership, knowledge sharing platform, technology and skill tra transfer, infrastructure investment can help kickstart development, raise productivity, create better quality job, and also enhance worker skill. Business also need to evolve with growing complexity of the development challenges in the past, the development work implemented by a private sector alone or through public-private partnership often look at the individual projects and initiative to address particular needs. This kind of focus project will still be needed, but the new reality also requires a more comprehensive approach, such as development of ecosystem and enabling mechanism. Through a PPP program, the group and its partner are developing Thailand's first high-speed rail line to help spur economic growth and shift uh, road to rail-based uh, transportation, lowering carbon emission as well as road accident. As to what should be done to support private sector development, I believe that the private sector would appreciate clear government policies and national development strategy, as well as open, honest dialogues among all stakeholders as equal partnerships with the understanding that we live in a highly dynamic world that uh, national policy and strategy must ad adapt quickly to changes. Uh, the commitment to address social and economic issues must be agreed upon, share among all parties through strong partnership for collaboration and exchange of ideas such as World Economic Forum, WBCSD, UNTC. In conclusion, you know, we must put aside our differences and wake up to the fact that the world now needs a much 
greater degree of collaboration and coordination of efforts and investment. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Napadol. That was uh, very succinct. And uh, also thank you for what you're doing, uh, not only in creating the masks, but employing uh, 48,000 people at this critical time uh, of need is, is uh, of tremendous significance. And let me also echo uh, your comments, and they were raised by other panelists, uh, that we need more collaboration and cooperation. Uh, if there's one thing that the pandemic has taught us, it's that uh, no company, no individual, and even the mightiest countries uh, cannot be islands uh, at this time. And uh, no wall is high enough to keep out the threats we face. Uh, and what that does keep out is our ability to cooperate, which is what we need uh, more than ever. Happily in Oxford, my scientific colleagues are collaborating with others, and so we hope we're going to have a vaccine uh, pretty soon, uh, towards the end of this year, distribution in the first quarter of next year. But uh, as I say, inshallah, let's hope that happens. <laughs>